we will design Jerusalem. Hi guys, Kaiser here. And in today's video, I've got something really special in mind for you. I'm gonna dip into my creative side and take a crack at theory crafting my very own civilization for Age of Empires 2. I wanna try to do something that feels like it fits in the game, but is also really unique and exciting and cool. And part of that comes up with the civilization itself. This is a really special civilization. It's been featured throughout Age of Empires 2 in various campaigns and civilization references, but it's not really in the game itself yet, and I would like to change that. That civilization is Outremer, and that refers to the Crusader states. We're talking Edessa, Antioch, Tripoli, and the crown jewel of them all, Jerusalem. Now, this video is really special for a couple of reasons. It's my very first ever theory crafting video, uh, and it's also not just one video, because I'm partnering up with some friends of mine, uh, Robbie Lava and Jimmy James 59 today are also releasing their own versions of the Outremer civilization. So if you really like this video, please consider liking it, subscribing to the channel, let me know you enjoyed it, uh, let me know if you want to see more of this kind of thing, and then be sure to check out their videos, because they've got some really cool designs too. I can't wait to see them, I know you guys are really going to enjoy them. But let's dive into today's video. And what I have is sort of three sections in mind. Now, if you want to just skip straight to the Age of Empires part, go ahead and jump to the timestamp on the screen. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the history of Outremer and uh, maybe answer some questions about whether or not these guys even belong in Age of Empires 2. Then we'll jump from that to actually talking about the civilization design, some of the overarching themes that I think any Outremer civilization should be aiming for how I try to aim at that. Uh, and then finally in part three, we'll briefly look at some discarded concepts and possible ideas if, if things are too weak or strong that we might change for the civilization. But let's go ahead and dive right in. Now I could spend hours talking about the history of Outremer, but for the sake of the video, I'll keep this short and to the point. Our story begins in 1095 when Pope Urban II calls for the first crusade. The original idea of the crusade was to marshal the forces of Europe and Christendom to go defend Byzantium against the growing power of the Seljuk Turks, and more broadly to, de uh, to defend Christian lands against the rising Islamic powers. But very quickly that objective changed and crystallized around capturing Jerusalem and the Holy Land. We see in 1098 the first major successes of the Crusades as the Crusaders go through Galatia and capture Edessa and Antioch giving birth to the very first crusader states, the county of Edessa and the principality of Antioch. Now the story surrounding Antioch is fascinating. Uh, as they were capturing the city, a mighty Seljuk army was on its way to recapture the city, repel this invasion, and end the crusader's story right here at its very beginning. Many of the crusaders turned tail and fled, and the ones that remained were certainly worried about this giant army. But in Antioch, as they were huddled in the city, uh, a monk kept having this reoccurring dream. The dream saying there was a relic buried at the heart of this monastery, and he needed to go find the relic and take it with them into the upcoming battle. And after having the dream over and over again, the monk goes to the leaders of the Crusades and says, Guys, I, I keep having this dream. We should go find this relic. They're skeptical, but they eventually decide to dig around, see what they find, and sure enough, they find a spear which they identify as the Holy Lance, the spear of Longinus that had pierced Jesus' side. They take it into battle, and, and according to Raymond of Aguilera, the spear had this miraculous divine power protecting the crusader soldiers around it from any form of damage from the many volleys of arrows shot their way. Now, whether you buy into that miraculous power or not, at the very least, the relic led to an incredible resurgence of morale with, among the Crusader armies, and they repelled and routed this much larger uh, Seljuk force. The Crusader morale refused to break, and ultimately, uh, again, they won the day. Now, this led to further victories, such as in 1099, the Siege of Jerusalem, again, the crown jewel forming the Kingdom of Jerusalem. And right after that siege, the Battle of Ascalon was this huge battle. They apparently find a part of the true cross there in Jerusalem and they take that relic into battle alongside the spear and at the battle of Ascalon they have another dramatic victory for the crusader forces 
Now that battle marks the end of the First Crusade. Many of the Crusaders go back. Those that remain and are left behind are here to actually develop these Crusader states and the Outremer civilization. Uh, and finally, in 1109, we do have the formation of the final four of the four, the county of Tripoli, when Tripoli is sieged and captured. Now, to summarize 200 years of history following this point, we, we notice several characteristics of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and their warfare in particular. The Crusaders were very adept at siege warfare. Many of their most famous and victorious battles surround uh, sieges, either sieges that they initiated or sieges on defense and responded to sieges. They were very good at sieging down cities. Um, we notice, of course, the foundation of the military orders. We see the Hospitaller, Templar, and Teutonic Knights. They are all founded in Jerusalem, in the kingdom of Jerusalem. And even though they are, to some extent, uh, independent organizations with their own objectives, they are inextricably linked to these crusader states and form an essential backbone of the crusader armies. I don't think any representation of Utremer would be complete without bringing in some wink and a nod to the military orders. Um, now, one thing to know about the Crusader states, they are very small territories. And that means that both economically and militarily, they, they don't have a lot to draw upon. Militarily, they don't have a large pool of manpower to pull from. So when it came to Crusader armies, they often relied on pilgrims and mercenaries and, and people coming in from overseas. Uh, that was the backbone of most of their armies. Now, the big exception to this are the Turkopoles. This is a cavalry force built of local Armenians and Syrians and other groups, and their tactics were developed specifically to combat the skirmish, hit-and-run tactics that were very common among Utremer's enemies. Uh, this is kind of like a real-world history version of a unique unit. Uh, they were actually developed in Byzantium, but very quickly adopted uh, by the Crusader states, and so we see both civilizations using these units very effectively. One thing about the Crusaders, they built castles everywhere. Karak Castle, Karak de Chevalier, some of the more famous ones, but it seems like everywhere you go they built castles, and for a variety of reasons. Defensively, offensively, economically, uh, they were master castle builders. But one other aspect I want to bring in too is the economy. Again, these Crusader states weren't very large, uh, most of their economy was centered around the coast. They had fertile land there along the coast, but more importantly, they really built and maintained trade networks. That was the lifeblood of the Utremeran economy. Uh, they exported things like olives, dates, figs, um, and then they imported in what they needed as well from across the Mediterranean trade network. Uh, so that's a really key aspect of this crusader culture to keep in mind. Now, in this slide, I highlight some of the battles and conflicts that the Crusader states got into over their 200-year history before finally being defeated in 1291 when the Mamluks swept away the last of the Crusader states. But what I want to highlight before we move on is simply to underline the fact that these four realms, Antioch, Edessa, Tripoli, and Jerusalem, these were four separate realms that pursued their own diplomacy. And they weren't as one-dimensionally religious warriors fighting everything that wasn't Christian as you might expect from a pop culture point of view. Uh, these guys, once they'd established themselves, were very much concerned with their own survival, and they initiated their own diplomacy. Oftentimes, crusader states would ally themselves with one Muslim power against another Muslim power. Sometimes they worked at cross-purposes to each other. Indeed, one of the issues throughout Utremeran history was infighting. Even talking about the Kingdom of Jerusalem, who's going to be king? Who's going to lead this new kingdom? Uh, so much conflict and fighting at cross purposes that inhibited the growth of the kingdom in those early stages. We see here in the slides things like the War of the Lombards in 1228 or the War of St. Sabas in 1256 where civil wars are breaking out or the, uh, the Hospitallers and the Templar are going to war against each other. There's not enough time to really get into the nitty-gritty of all of this history, but suffice it to say that there are really fascinating stories, and it's a lot more complex than just 
uh, re religious zealots that are fighting against everything not them and burning up because of their religious fervor. Right? There's a really fascinating historical story surrounding each of these four kingdoms and the back and forth and the diplomatic intrigue happening over this 200 year period. I did want to highlight though that that infighting is a big theme and I think even directed my understanding of how to develop the civilization a little bit. Now that leads me to three questions, and I have seen these sorts of questions brought up all the time whenever the idea of a crusader civilization or an Ultramarin civilization is brought up. Three questions. One, is Ultramar really its own civilization? I mean, aren't they already represented by the Europeans in game? And there is a point to this. I mean, the enemies of Ultramar often just called them Franks, right? Uh, they were known as the, La uh, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, was known as the Latin Kingdom. Obviously, the Teutonic Knights are already represented in game by the German civilization, the Teutons. And so it leaves you wondering, you know, can't we just say that they're already covered by the umbrella that is the Franks or the Teutons or Italy, the Italians, something like that? Do they really need to be their own civilization? I think that's a good question worth asking. Are they well known or interesting enough to be worth including? And then finally, is there enough historical material there to make for an interesting AoE2 Civ? Well, let's dive into that first question. I think that's the strong or the most, I don't know, the question I see most often. I think it's worth talking about. And I think that we can at least make a very good argument that no, this civilization deserves to stand out as its own. And I'll point to this quote by Fouché of Chartre. Chartre? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But Foucher, uh, he says shortly after the capture of Jerusalem, this is about 20 years, I believe, after Jerusalem is captured, 20 or 30 years, and he is writing back to Europe and basically advertising what's going on in the kingdom of Jerusalem. And he makes this fascinating quote. He says, We who were once Occidentals have now become Orientals. He who was of Rhymes or Chartres has now become a citizen of Tyre or Antioch. We've already forgotten the places of our birth. Already these are unknown to many of us. We're not mentioned anymore. Some have already uh, some already possess homes or households by inheritance. Some have taken wives, not only of their own people, but Syrians, Armenians, or even Saracens who've achieved the grace of baptism. Words of different languages have become the common property known to each nationality, and mutual faith unites those who are ignorant of their descent. He who was born a stranger is now as one born here, he who was born an alien has become a native. And I find that so fascinating, and it doesn't get any better of a quote to describe the idea that they really have their own civilization brewing. Uh, over this 200-year period, there is intermingling going on uh, among the different ethnicities. There's an intermingling of the languages. Uh, we do see, not in this quote, but uh, the Utramaran civilization was developing its own sense of art and architecture. Um... There's this fascinating melting pot taking place in the Crusader states. And so, to my mind, they definitely stand out as just culturally very unique. This is not just a French outpost or a, an Italian outpost, uh, but there is really this developing new culture taking place. I mean, I'll just be real with you guys. I think if Burgundy can be in Age of Empires II and be represented as its own civilization distinct from the Franks, I think there's no doubt Outremer, with its unique culture, its unique way of doing military, uh, its, its military situation, just the, the, ec the economy, with everything that's unique and special about this part of the world at this time, I'd say, yeah, they, they are unique and they aren't just captured by the Italians or the Teutons or what have you. They deserve to be in the game, in my opinion. Are they well known? Now, from a pop culture perspective, obviously, right? When we think of the medieval ages and kind of that original AoE 2 Age of Kings, what are we thinking of? Samurai and Vikings, and right there at the heart of it all, Crusaders, right? They stand out as particularly special uh, and, and just they capture the imagination, right? Um, so I no doubt from a pop culture point of view, but even more so for those who really love history and want to do that deep dive, there's a lot more going on than just that pop culture image there's so much you can draw upon so many fascinating historical figures heroes and villains on both sides of the battlefields that the Ultramarin uh, civilization and the kingdom has got themselves into that would make for fascinating stories 
Uh, even, I think some, some highlights for me would be Sibylla or Melisande, uh, princesses and queens of the region. I think, uh, actually, a, a kind of an outsider choice, I think Jocelyn III would make for an excellent choice, let alone some of the more obvious choices like Baldwin I or Baldwin IV or what have you. You have factions like the Byzantines, the Armenians, Saracens, Turks, Ethiopians. Uh, they were allied to the, uh, the Fatimids as archers. Persians, Mongols, Italians, Sicilians, Teutons, Franks, Britons. So much you can draw upon on these different campaigns and missions you could develop for the Civ. Yeah, there's a lot to work with there. And finally, as a little bit of a side note, why am I calling them Utremer and Utremerans? Why don't I call them Crusaders, Levantines, Jerusalemites? The reason why. Crusaders is kind of more of a job than it is a civilization. And I want to highlight that these kingdoms were more than just the First Crusade or the Third Crusade. I think it's very important. It's a, it's a, a, a massive part of the origination of these kingdoms and this civilization. But that's, it's, there's more going on than just the Crusades. Uh, and as for Jerusalemites, well, I want to capture Edessa and Antioch and Tripoli as well uh, to capture the broader culture. Levantines might work a little better, but for me, it's a little too clinical. I love this medieval term, Outremer. That's what was used in the medieval time frame to describe this part of the world. And that fits with uh, what we see of the Teutons or the Franks, the Saracens. Those also were labels used in the medieval period to describe these groups. And so I think Outremer fits right in as the name that would describe uh, an AOE2 civilization going all the way back to Age of Kings. It, it just works for me. So that's why I picked that name. So finally, we've got to ask, well, how would they actually show up in AoE 2? This is what you're here for. Let's start off by looking at the big idea, the big themes that we're trying to capture with this civilization. Then I'll move to the civilization bonuses, and then the unique units, the unique techs, and finally, the tech tree. Let's dive in. I think, first of all, that Untramaran civilization should be a civilization that's all about religious warfare. And in particular, I find the idea of fighting around relics fascinating. We see that in the history of this civilization. And uh, there's a lot of design opportunity, I think, in AoE 2 to explore this. Relics are already in the game, but for every civilization other than maybe the Lithuanians, relics don't really mean anything more than grabbing them, throwing them in a monastery, and getting some gold. The idea of fighting around relics I think is really cool, and there's an opportunity to do something very unique there. I think it's worth exploring. Obviously, also we have the military orders in the back of the mind, the Hospitaller, the Templar Knights, the Teutonic Knights. We've got to do something cool with them, so let's keep that in mind. Overall, I think that they should be a slow, resilient faction, adept at siege, but vulnerable to harassment. Now, that fits the historical profile to a T. They were very strong in head-on engagements, very good at siege, but they were weak whenever they got pulled off and whenever the enemy was able to use these harassing tactics and able to split up Crusader armies, that's when they lost. And so uh, that fits the historical profile. It makes sense in-game. The problem is this also describes civs already in the game, like the Teutons or the Slavs. So we've got to find a unique way of capturing this concept. And I think I've come up with something pretty unique when it comes to resiliency. Now, one way that they are different, I don't think that this should be a late-game powerhouse. I think this should be a civilization that is all about power spikes and tempo, taking control of the battlefield at the right moment, lest you fall off in the late game. I think, again, makes sense historically, and makes them kind of unique in the AoE 2 world compared to other castle civs or slow, grindy powerhouse civs. I think it's pretty cool. Now, with Ultramare, castles have to be a big theme for them, right? But here's the thing. We've already got cheaper castles. We have faster building castles. We've got to find something new. There's a quote by Helena P. Schrader that I find fascinating, and I'll just highlight part of it, where she says, Castles were also used as administrative and economic centers. They meant a lot more than just defensive fortifications, and that gives us a unique theme to build off of. Looking at their economy, uh, Outremer was very much focused on the coast. Uh, trade was a big thing for them, uh, and not even just trade, but even uh, like their farmlands were built along the coast. That's where a lot of their economic development went, and they were trading and exporting things again, like figs or dates or olives, and capturing that, I think, could be a unique idea. And then finally, I do find it fun and interesting that 
these crusader states often imported in soldiers from overseas. And I think it'd be fun to maybe lean into that and find something cool to do with that concept. So with that in mind, let's dive into the civilization. Here's what I've got. First, foragers and shepherds generate gold. Now in this design, I'm not going to share a lot of numbers. They can be tweaked pretty easily, but uh, I do say maybe about like five gold per sheep, 10 gold per berry bush. This is supposed to represent the idea of exporting the dates and the olives and the silk and whatever else. Um, it's not really a huge bonus, but it gives them just a little bit of flexibility in the early game to pursue different strategies, whether it's a drush, an archer rush, a fast castle, whatever. Um, gives them just some flexibility that I think is fun. The second bonus is a cool economic bonus. Docks and castles serve as universal drop-off points. Villagers earn 15% more resources when depositing at this at these buildings. Now this is really neat because you can play in a couple of different ways depending on the map. Let's say you're on Nomad or Four Corners or Four Lakes or something like that. Uh, you send a villager across the map to go build a dock and churn out some fishing ships, right? He builds the dock. Normally what you have to do is get some shore fish and then trudge him all the way back to the town center, right? Well here what you can do is, let's say you build that dock near some berry bushes or some gold or whatever. He builds the dock, collects the shore fish, gets a little bit of extra fish from that shore fish, and then can turn around and work on the berries or the gold or whatever. He can stay by that dock and be productive and resourceful and even get some extra resources out of doing it uh, to maybe compensate for the, you know, how far he's having to walk back and forth. So that's pretty neat. In an extreme situation, you could even build a farm next to the dock and he could work there, drop the food off at the dock, and again, get a little bit of extra food from working at that dock. It's risky, but it might pay off. Then in the mid-game, even on Arabia or something like that, um, you get into that mid-game situation, you're encouraged to drop castles on critical resources across the map, lay claim to them, and get extra resources out of working from that castle. So I think that's just a really unique spin on encouraging a player to drop castles throughout the map. It's pretty neat um, and different from any other bonus that I've seen in the game. But I, I think it's pretty cool. Melee. Now this third bonus right here, this is my pride and joy. This is the theme that I built the rest of the civilization around. Melee kills create a burst area of effect heal when a relic is within the unit's line of sight. Now that means even in the feudal age, when there are no monks around, if you're able to get a fight going around a relic, a, a scout versus scout battle, or spears versus spears, or whatever else, um, clashing minute arm rushes, what ends up happening is, if there's a nearby relic, your scout deals that killing blow to an enemy scout, and immediately a burst of health affects all nearby Ultramarine units. It's not supposed to be a lot, because it can chain pretty easily, but it might only be 5 HP or 7 HP or something like that. But you get that kill, you get a little bit of burst healing, and then if the fight keeps going, then you just keep getting those heals with every kill, and it starts chaining onto each other. And that is where the resiliency comes in from Ultramer. See, I wanted them to be a, a, a powerful, head-on civilization, but I didn't want to give them extra armor or extra HP. We already have plenty of that in the game. So instead, finding something unique, Thought, well, what if they get resiliency through healing and healing through combat? Next, we have devotion and siege engineers are free. Now, devotion is just a fun wink and a nod to the whole idea of these this culture emerging out of the Crusades and the religious fervor. I think it makes sense that devotion would be a free technology uh, that the civilization would get. It's just a little bit harder to convert them in the Castle Age, right? You don't have to worry about picking up that technology. It's not a lot of resources, but it's something cute. What's maybe more impactful is in the Imperial Age, you get access to Siege Engineers right away. Now, Siege Engineers makes your Siege units uh, stronger, and it gives them a little bit more range. And so what that means is, as soon as you hit the Imperial Age, your Mangonel, they are doing more damage, they're shooting farther. If you get into a Treb War, like right away, your Trebs have more range and they're doing more damage than the enemy Trebs. So for a brief period of time, until they pick up Siege Engineers of their own, uh, you have the advantage in a Treb versus Treb battle. So again, you're an adept 
skilled player when it comes to Siege, which makes sense for Ultramav. This next one is kind of fun. It's a little bit unique. A little zany. I think this is my zaniest bonus, but I like it. Castle Technologies research 200% slower, and they cost 200 more gold. Ouch, right? This is a nerf, a malus. But these technologies also spawn units. You get one Bosant Templar Knight and two Teutonic Knights for each castle technology researched. Now, forget the Bosant Templar Knight for a second. We'll come back to that. So what I'm imagining is you get two Teutonic Knights for every castle tech you've researched. So you research one tech, your, your Castle Age unique tech, in the Castle Age, and you get two Teutonic Knights. Doesn't mean a lot. But then the Imperial Age comes, and you research your Imperial Unique tech, and you get four Teutonic Knights. And then you pick up Hoardings, and you get six Teutonic Knights. There are, not counting spies, five Castle Techs in total. So you can do the math. You can accrue a nice little group of Teutonic Knights. It's a fun wink and a nod uh, to the fact that the Teutonic Order was founded in Jerusalem. You otherwise cannot train Teutonic Knights. Um, so they're not really a part of the civilization other than with this one bonus, which is, again, just a fun, like, wink and a nod to the Teutonic Knights being founded in Ultramare. Their team bonus. Monastery units gain pierce armor and movement speed around relics. Now, what I'm imagining here is that uh, you gain some pierce armor and some movement speed when you are around the relic as a monastery unit, a monk or a warrior priest or whatever. But then you get even more movement speed and pierce armor when you're actually the one picking up the relic. And that's not super helpful for other civilizations, but for Ultramer, this is a very important bonus because what you're wanting to do is actually take these relics and go into battle. And this bonus means that if you overplay your hand, you get caught out, there is still a little bit better of a chance that you might actually be able to escape with that relic instead of sacrificing it at the feet of your enemy. Right? You've got to be careful with them, but I don't want to punish you too much if you happen to get caught out. So, those are my civilization bonuses. Let's talk about the unique units. And I've got one regional unit and two unique units. The Turkopole, the Hospitaller Knight, and the Templar Knight. And then you might say, wait a minute, what about that Boson Templar Knight? We'll get to him in a second, but for right now, don't count him. We've got three units. One regional unit, two unique units. First, the Turkopole. All right, the Turkopole is a unique upgrade that replaces the Light Cavalry and the Hussar upgrades. So uh, what we're going to see is that the Ultramer Civ, they're not very good in trash warfare. The, their, their spearmen and their skirmishers are really not that great. The exception is the Light Cav is really good because you get access to the Turkopole. Turkopole, uh, this upgrade costs a little bit more than the Light Cav and Hussar upgrade. But what you get is a Light Cav unit it does normal light cavalry things, but it also has a ranged charge attack. Whenever its charge bar is full, the next attack is a ranged shot. It's not supposed to be super long range, but it does a ranged shot, and if that arrow connects, if the attack hits, the unit loses movement speed temporarily. For a brief period of time, it slows down, and that allows the Turkopole to jump in and more effectively uh, collapse on the opponent and get that attack going. Right, um, And it also deals additional damage to cavalry archers. So uh, this is a really good unit for catching up to cavalry archers and fighting them off. Um, it's good on, for jumping onto vulnerable units. If they get caught out, the Turkopole is great at capitalizing on that and jumping in and slowing them. It's a really cool unit. Now, considering the history of the Turkopole, I imagine that... This is a unit that the Byzantines would also get access to. Many Turkopole were Armenians from Cilicia, Armenia. Cilicia, Armenia. So maybe the Armenians would make sense as well. I also have the Georgians and the Sicilians on there, but that's really not as likely. I think primarily the Byzantines and the Armenians are where the Turkopole would make sense as a regional unit. So they're pretty strong. They're pretty cool units, but uh, they're really the only good trash unit that Utremer gets. Next up, we have the Hospitaller. Now, I will admit, one of the things that inspired me to even make this civilization was the emergence of the Warrior Priest with the Mountain Royals DLC. I think that was amazing, and I thought to myself, wow, what a cool unit. If only there was an Ultramarine civilization, because 
there's nothing more warrior priest than the warrior monks that are the Hospitaller or the Templar, the Teutonic Knights, whatever. Um, so I thought it'd be cool to bring them in. You could just make the Hospitaller a reskin of the warrior priest. Or, here's my idea. What if we make the Hospitaller a warrior priest spearman unit trained out of monasteries? So this is kind of a spearman version of the warrior priest. It's a better all-around version than the pikeman, but it costs gold, and it's vulnerable to light cavalry and skirmishers. So it basically does the same thing as a warrior priest. It's a spearman unit, so it actually does a pretty good job fighting off knights. It can you know, heal other units just like a warrior priest can. It can collect relics just like a warrior priest can. However, it's vulnerable to not just light cav, like a warrior priest, but also vulnerable to skirmishers. Skirmishers do bonus damage to Hospitaller Knights. So they're doubly vulnerable, more vulnerable than Warrior Priests are in that context. Then we have the Templar Knight. This is the Castle Unique Unit, and here's what I'm imagining. I like the idea of a support unit. Uh, I like the Centurion for the Romans, for example. Although I, I think that we could maybe punch that support element even harder, so... That's where I've got the Templar Knight design coming in. This is a very heavily armored unit, but it has a low rate of fire and a long train time. So it's very difficult to mass up an army of nothing but Templar Knights, unless you have a lot of castles, which you're the Ultramarine civilization. Maybe you do have a lot of castles, but uh, otherwise, you know, initially, it's hard to mass up Templar. You're going to want to mix these guys into your cavalry force. Uh, like They're like a warrior priest. Templar Knights, they heal units out of combat. And they benefit from sanctity and fervor. They can't carry relics, uh, but they're kind of a mobile attacking healing unit. They're really, really cool in that way. On top of that, they also have a very slowly charging charge attack. And when that charge attack is full, it's kind of a mini Obuk strike. Uh, the Templar Knight uh, deals this devastating blow that strips away a little bit of melee armor from its target. Maybe like one or two melee armor from an opponent. That charge attack replenishes very slowly, but it does charge up faster when near a relic. So if you're bringing a relic into combat, or if you're taking that Templar, he's fighting, and then you, you draw him back to a relic, then that charge attack charges up faster, and he can do it again more quickly in the next battle. Uh, so, and that's just a, the, the idea of the stripping that melee armor means that it's a little bit easier for your Night Horde to get those melee kills to, again, chain that healing and get that resiliency going for your army, right? That's the theme there. Now, there's one last uh, spin on this that I think is pretty cool. The Bosant Templar Knight. This guy is identical to a regular Templar Knight. There's just a couple of spins. One, uh, visually, so it's the same guy idea as a regular Templar Knight, except he carries the Wexum Belli, the Bosant, the war flag of the Templar. Um, and there's a cool historical side to this that I won't get into, but the Templar, they were famous for fighting around their war flag and going down to the last man for fighting around that war flag. So that's why I brought this unit in, and I'm representing the Bosant Templar Knight from a historical point of view. I also think I've got a cool gameplay side to it, too. It's identical to a Templar Knight, other than it's got the visual of the flag, right? This unit cannot be trained. So the only way you can get a Bosant Templar Knight is by researching those castle texts, um, and like hoardings and the unique texts and everything at the castle. The Bosant Templar Knight provides the same benefit as a relic for Ultramar units. So this is a way that you can get that relic bonus without uh, having to actually risk a relic in the battlefield. Or you're in a situation where you never picked up any relics because your opponent got them all, then you still have access to your bonuses uh, with the Bosant Templar Knight. But you got to be careful, because if you lose these guys here, that's it, game over, right? At least as far as that bonus goes. And finally, it does come with a risk of its own. If the Bosant Templar Knight dies, then all nearby surrounding Ultramarine units lose movement speed temporarily. So if he dies, it's very easy for the enemy to jump in on a vulnerable civilization and clean up 
the rest of your units. So you do want to be very careful with this guy, even though um, you know, he is pretty important to your army. That leads us to the unique text. Pactum Wormundi in the Castle Age. The Mangonel line and naval units do more damage to structures. What I'm thinking is that with this civilization, you're probably weak to archers. You'll want to build Mangonel anyway. And you are a very strong siege civilization. Uh, this bonus just adds on to that. You've got the Mangonel up. You research Pactum Wormundi and all of a sudden, your Mangonel are doing more damage um, to structures. It's not really helping you win a fight against other units, but if you've won that fight, you are more easily sieging down walls, you're more easily taking on town centers and the like. You are a threat with your siege units. Uh, likewise, and this is actually referencing the history even better, I think, uh, considering what Pact of Mormon was, your naval units as well do more damage to land targets, uh, to structures specifically. Uh, so, not really helping you win a naval battle, but if you're on a map like Islands or something, a team game, and you have won the naval combat, this means that you do an easier job knocking down docks and destroying barracks and town centers that were built on the coast and the like. Um, your units are better at that because of this unique tech. In the Imperial Age, you have a tech called Audita Tremendi, and it does a couple of things. It gives your Hospitallers a ranged shield, kind of a Shravamsha-style shield, that recharges very slowly, but it does recharge faster when you're a relic. The Templar Knight's charge attack also recharges faster. And then finally, you get three longbowmen and three throwing axemen for every castle lost and relic garrisoned by the enemy. So kind of breaking this down, I mean, both the Hospitaller bonus and the Templar Knight bonus, it just makes these powerful military order units a little bit better. It gives the Hospitallers some resiliency against their weaknesses. Uh, skirmishers and archers. Um, it takes just a couple more shots to knock them down. Uh, this is a Castle Age unit that's definitely going to be falling off in the Imperial Age. So this gives them something to keep them, um, to keep them somewhat competitive as we go into the Imperial Age. right? And then it also helps your Templar Knights too. This final element to the bonus is kind of cool, I think. The idea here, historically, you're referencing the Third Crusade as the, the British and the French are coming in. The, the Teutons are already represented as well. So those three nations coming in to help the Ultramarine civilization I think is cool. But from a gameplay perspective, I also think this is neat because if you're in a situation where you have an opponent who's captured all of the relics or most of the relics and he's already knocked down two or three castles, you're probably losing the game, right? You are on the back foot. And as a tempo civilization, you are probably already losing at that point. This civilization tech gives you kind of one last really big break for you know trying to turn the tide. You get one decently sized army of longbowmen and throwing axemen that you maybe can use to uh, attack an enemy, maybe who are massing up archers or pikemen or whatever they might prove really helpful. If you're already winning the game, you've collected most of the relics and you have, you know, you haven't lost any castles, this bonus really doesn't do that much for you. You'd want to research this technology quickly in order to make your hospitallers and your templar better, but you know, if you're if you're behind, it gives you that extra bonus, which I think is pretty cool. I might need to tweak the numbers a little bit. I can imagine situations where it might be too much, but um, I think it's a pretty cool idea. Now diving into the tech tree, you will notice a theme with Outremer, which is a really strong options in the mid game, but then opportunities fall off in the late game if you allow gold to run out. They're very Turk-like. You've got a really nice barracks, full access to the militia line, all the blacksmith techs are there. You've got the Hospitaller Knights to help out your infantry forces. The main thing you're missing is Halberdier. So if you get into a post M situation, no gold on the map, and you've got pikemen, your opponent has Hal, but you're in trouble. Archers is a weakness for Outremer. Uh, now, historically, they did have pretty good crossbows. Uh, so it, it would make sense to give them good crossbows. And in the Castle Age, they're not bad. You've got full blacksmith techs. You do have thumb ring. You also get cav archer. But you will notice you are missing elite skirmisher. This is a huge weakness for Outremer. So this just encourages your foe to go 
heavy into archers to oppose you. And you've got to rely on things like Turkopole or your Mangonel uh, to stop the enemy just shooting you down with arrows. Looking at their stable, Ultramare has a very good stable. I mean, you get access to Paladin, you've got the full blacksmith upgrades, you have the Turkopole and the elite Turkopole replacing the Light Cab and the Asar upgrades. You've got the Templar Knight and the Bosant Templar Knight to help out your cavalry armies, giving them that extra resiliency and the, the shredding of armor to help them chew through opponents faster. You even get access to Camel Riders. I mean, this is a Middle Eastern civilization. This is reflecting the blending of the European and the Arabic and the Turkic and the Syrian cultures all mingling together in Outremer, right? So you do get the Camel Rider. You do not get access to the Heavy Camel Rider, however. So you've got to rely on your very strong uh, knight options at that point. Siege Workshop is very good. You don't get the Bombard Cannon. I could see an argument for taking away the Heavy Scorpion, but right now, you get access to all of it. You just miss out on Bombard Cannon because Outremer fell before Gunpowder really became a big theme in Medieval Warfare. The Monastery, the University, the Dock. The Monastery, you are a religious civilization. It's no surprise you get access to a lot of texts. You actually are missing out on Redemption, my thought process there was you have such strong units, including such strong siege, that it seemed to me maybe unfair if your opponent is trying to repel this really strong siege push with siege of their own, and you're able to just convert it with some monks. So right now, I have redemption as a no-go. Uh, maybe you can argue for it, but right now, they don't get it. Uh, university, they get everything except for Bombard Tower. The Dock, they don't get Cannon Galleon, and they also don't get Shipwright. Now you have a very strong navy with Pacta Mormundi, but, again, both reflecting history and for balance purposes, that strong navy does come at a cost. Uh, you are a civilization that has to try to end the game before it goes late. If it's a long, grindy game, you're probably going to lose as Ultramar. And then the economy. This is a big weakness of theirs. You see they are missing all of the late-game ecotext. No crop rotation, no two-man saw, no advanced gold mining or stone mining. You do get access to a really solid trade route. Uh, so in a team game situation, they might not fall off nearly as hard. But in a 1v1, again, you're going to fall behind other players who have stronger late game economies. And here in part three, I get to share with you my final thoughts. And I've got to say, guys, I'm really excited about this civilization design. I think this version of Ultramare would be a lot of fun to play in Age of Empires 2. It brings in some really exciting, unique bonuses to the battlefield. And I think people would enjoy playing this. Having said that, there are two questions that are in the back of my mind that I think would have to be addressed. One, is the relic bonus worth it? I don't want it to be OP, but you are risking a relic on the battlefield in order to take advantage of these bonuses. And so I want to make sure it feels worthwhile and that players feel like they have an important tactical decision in front of them. Um, I can imagine a world where a player says, why would I ever risk a relic if I want healing? I'll just send in monks, or my Templar Knights, or my Hospitaller Knights. I could see a world where a player says, why would I ever risk a relic when the Bosant Templar Knight can do the same job? So I could imagine having to tweak some things in order to make sure that players feel like taking a relic into battle is worthwhile. I'll tell you one thing that I think could be cool, I considered adding this in, is what if the uh, Pactum Mormundi, the Castle Age Unique Tech, it also gave the Archer line plus one attack strength when they are around relics. I think that would be neat because it means in the Castle Age you have better than average crossbows, and in the Imperial Age, your crossbows are not as weak in comparison to Arbalest as they otherwise would be. It would make sense historically because they did have very good crossbows in Outremer. Uh, from a gameplay point of view, I wanted to make sure I wasn't making the civilization overpowered, so I left that out in this version. But I could see a world in which that might be worth bringing in, and that could be fun. Um, two, is the shipment bonus too gimmicky? The whole idea of shipping in units with technologies, I think it's really neat. Uh, I know that some people, they already have kind of a distaste for this sort of thing from the Flemish Burgundian Revolution, the Sicilian First Crusade. I think the way that this would work mechanically would be different and people would not mind it as much, but I could be mistaken. Plus, 
there's already so much going on with this version of Ultramare. I could see people saying, look, with everything else going on, we don't need this shipping units bonus on top of that. And better to make it a little bit simpler on this side in order to make everything else stand out more. But I like the idea of representing uh, the pilgrims and the soldiers from overseas coming in to help the Crusader states. I think it's unique, and it makes this Civ stand out. For the sake of time, I want to go ahead and wrap it up now. Let me know in the comments below. Do you like the idea of this civilization? Uh, what do you think is really cool? What do you think is maybe you would change some things? What do you think about the answer to these questions? And finally, let me encourage you to also check out Robbie Lava's and Jimmy James 59's versions of Ultramare as well. I know that Robbie Lava is going to push his creativity to the limit on this one. And Jimmy James 59 is going to add in this cavalry foot archer angle that I did not bring into my version. So it'll be really interesting to see how these three civs compare. Guys, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. For now, this is the Iron Kaiser signing out. God bless, guys.